Hi there. Welcome back to the machine learning lecture. This week, we will talk about Gaussian processes. For this, we will reuse some of the things that you've heard about previously, such as Bayesian inference and multivariate Gaussians, kernels. So if you wanted to review these topics anyways, now might be a good time. Now here we can again see some data where we have some observed values for which we know the function values and many unobserved values for which we don't know the function value. Now we want to perform regression to find out something about these unobserved values. And one approach that we could use for this is linear regression as you have seen in a previous week. However, it would be nice to also get a measure about how certain we are about certain values. So not only the output is interesting, but also how certain we are about that output. So let's say we get some output value for 1.8. It's between two known values, so we are pretty certain that it should be somewhere around here. On the other hand, for input 3.5, we don't have very much information. So we probably won't be that certain about the output here. So in order to get such a measure of uncertainty, we model our regression function in a probabilistic way. And we do this by defining a distribution over functions. But let's first look back on distributions over vectors. So you probably remember Bayesian inference, where we put a prior on our data, and then after having observed some data points, we can then refine our belief and derive a posterior distribution of our data. So one possible prior is a multivariate Gaussian distribution, which is defined by a mean and a covariance. Remember, if we sample a large number of data points from that distribution, the histogram will look a lot like the probability density. Here we can see an example for a one-dimensional Gaussian with mean zero and sigma one. And let's say we observe some data points, for example, here, 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 and here. Then the posterior distribution would probably look something like that, roughly. We can also do this for multiple dimensions. In the lecture on multivariate normal or Gaussian distributions, you also looked at some properties like what happens when you marginalize out one of the dimensions or you condition on a subset of the dimensions. All of these things will be important for Gaussian processes. Now, how do we get from distributions over vectors to functions? In a sense, a function is an infinitely long vector of values. There's a pretty nice intuitive explanation for how to get from one-dimensional to two-dimensional Gaussians to functions. And you will find this in a video here. So if we interpret a function as essentially a very long vector of values, then we can use our Gaussian distributions over vectors to model a distribution over functions. And in this picture, you see the result of such a distribution. We have our data from before and 10 draws from a Gaussian process. You can see that for input 1.8, we seem to be pretty certain about what the output should be, as basically all functions go through a very narrow range. And for 3.5, we have multiple possibilities and a larger range for the output. But let's look at what a Gaussian process is a little more formally. So a Gaussian process describes a distribution over functions, and it is defined by a mean function and by a covariance function. And we'll talk about what both of these mean in a minute. Notice how even the notation here is very similar to what we know from multivariate Gaussians, where we'll have mean mu and covariance sigma. So we said earlier that a function is basically an infinitely long vector, which means that a Gaussian process is basically a multivariate normal with an infinite number of dimensions. However, we can't really work with an infinite number of dimensions 
And we are saved by a property of the multivariate Gaussian, and that is if we take a subset of the dimensions, then these will be jointly Gaussian distributed as well. This will also help us to sample from a Gaussian process, because we can just take a certain number of data points, say 100, compute the mean function and covariance function for those data points, and then sample from the respective joint Gaussian distribution. So that was the formal definition. Informally, what we are trying to do with the Gaussian process is to encode that if we have two vectors that are close to each other, then their function value should be similar to. The covariance function k takes care of that by returning a measure of the similarity of two vectors that also encodes how similar their function values should be. And with the mean function, we additionally can encode some a priori expectation that we have of the unknown function. So here we can incorporate domain knowledge that we might have. Then for inference, what we do is that we condition the unknown function values on the known ones, so the ones that we already observed and know the function values for. And for the case where there are no similar known values near an unknown point, there the mean function will dominate the result. Like we said before, we can use the mean function to encode some prior knowledge about our function. But in most cases, we don't know that much. So we simply set the mean function to be zero everywhere. And that also makes sense because we can always just normalize the output to have zero mean. As it turns out, that doesn't restrict us very much because the covariance function is actually where the magic happens. So the covariance function should be a measure of similarity between two vectors. And there are two properties that ensure that k needs to be symmetric and also positive semi-definite. And the combination of those two properties should feel somewhat familiar to you because that's exactly what a kernel is as well. That means everything that you've learned about kernels is applicable to Gaussian processes as well. How to build a kernel, how to combine them, how to prove that something is a kernel, everything can be used for Gaussian processes as well. The most commonly used covariance function is the squared exponential kernel, which we also call the Gaussian kernel or the RBF kernel, which stands for radial basis function kernel. It has two hyperparameters, the length scale L and an output variance sigma, where the length scale defines the influence of a function value in this direction. So with a lower length scale, only points that are very close are going to be influenced by one data point. With a rather large length scale, the influence spreads a bit wider. Sigma specifies the height of the kernel, which just tells us how far away from the mean function we can go. Let's take a look at one particular covariance matrix. We have four data points, 0, 0 0.2, 1, and 3. And we use a very simple squared exponential kernel with length scale 1 and output variance 1 as well. We compute all of the individual kernel values. Then we get this matrix right here. Now using the marginalization property of multivariate Gaussians, if you want to take a look at how just two function values are related to each other, then we just have to look at a submatrix of the covariance. So for example, for F1 and F2, we just need to look at this part. And here is some plot for these individual submatrices. On the left, we see that if we have two points that are close to each other, such as 0 and 0 0.2, then knowing something about the function value for 0 reveals a lot about the function value for 0 0.2. So they co very, very strongly. On the other hand, when the covariance is very small, then knowing something about f1 does not reveal very much about f4, which makes sense since 0 and 3 are actually quite far apart. Note that there is a tiny error here. We are actually conditioning on f1 equals negative 1.5 in all three cases. This concludes the basics about Gaussian processes.
In the next video, we will talk about how to actually use them for regression.